Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you, Garib, uh, for, uh, for the invitation and for this important and timely uh, event. Uh, now, I think uh, the problem space for Islamist movements in the Middle East has changed. The problem space, uh, what I mean by this is the, the context, the conditions that shape the fundamental questions that uh, leading actors like Islamist movements on the ground uh, seek to address, seek to find a solution to, seek to, uh, seek to resolve. <clears throat> now, if you look at from one, one aspect of it, the, everything is just same. Uh, the Middle East for so long is, was home to the authoritarian regimes. Um, political scientists love to talk about waves of democratization in the world, but none of these waves has reached the shores of the Middle East. Uh, but for so long, this, especially after the end of the uh, Cold War, this was like an, uh, an embarrassment for uh, Western policymakers uh, to come to terms with, to explain to the public in some way or another. This was like an, an organized hypocrisy that they had to account for. Uh, but what has changed over the last decade uh, with the eruption of Arab uprisings and, and how it unfolded, uh, is that we see a retrenchment, a solidification uh, of, of authoritarianism, and not just in the Middle East. Um, it's a global phenomenon, as you all know from, uh, from the United States, from uh, Western uh, European uh, democracies. We see uh, populist trends, uh, proto-fascistic movements, uh, right-wing and left-wing populism uh, sweeping all across uh, the world. And in that kind of uh, a world, um, uh, the fact that uh, authoritarian autocratic regimes or military dictatorships are backed is not so much of a big problem. It, at least it was an embarrassment before. It was something that they had to account for in some way or another. Um, of course, on the ground, uh, it, it means solidification of um, uh, the authoritarian regimes that are uh, in geopolitical alliance with, uh, with uh, great powers uh, outside the region. Uh, but there is another important issue that I want to raise about this changing uh, problem space, which is that Islamists, up until uh, the Arab Spring, with, with the exception of probably Turkey and, and a few uh, exceptions, um, they did not come to power. And now, uh, for example, in Egypt, uh, the uh, Brotherhood government lasted only one year, but still the, the kind of perception is that Islamists came to power and they couldn't handle it. We might contest whether this was true or not as a statement, um, but this is a governing perception on the ground, that Islamists came to power. Either they were not prepared, they were not willing, they were not ready, uh, or some people think that they were actually good, they were not given the chance, and they will never be given that chance. So it's better not to play that gamble and turn our countries, uh, or put our countries into, into trouble. This is one, one perception. Or the other is that they just uh, couldn't uh, do it. They tried, they tested, they couldn't do it. Now, with the massive propaganda machine that is at place in these autocratic regimes, um, it's not difficult to uh, think, realize that this kind of a perception uh, is holding ground. And I think th this is a very important development for that purpose. Over the last three decades, Islamist movements uh, bet on democracy and democratization. Um, of course, you know, I agree with, uh, with previous speakers, Duay Bey and, and, and Watah Bey, who talked about the diversity of Islamist movements, of course. But one of the things that was driving what we here call political Islamic movements uh, is, was a clear renunciation of, of violence, uh, a willingness to participate in electoral processes and try to win the hearts and minds of the people to come to power. And playing that game, playing, playing uh, participating into the democratic politics, uh, was the Islamist strategy in general, or that political Islamist line. Now we see a solidification of it. Now, regionally and global, solidification of authoritarian movements, a closure of uh, peaceful channels of opposition, a closure uh, of 
possible ways to attain political power peacefully. Now that's a huge problem. Plus, uh, when you add the um, propaganda machine of the autocratic regimes, um, the appeal of Islamist movements on the ground is also on decline. Uh, the appeal of Islamist movements from within Islamist movements is on the decline. Uh, so this is something that uh, Islamist movements have to tackle with. I think it's a very important. So we, we cannot assume as if uh, the Arab uprisings never happened and everything continues the same. We just do the same, and uh, Islamist movements do the same and come to power, and uh, the game continues from where it left. Um, I think this cannot hold. Islamist movements have to come to terms with this experience uh, that they have come to power. Of course, their experience in power was also diverse. The experience of Tunisia is different from, from Egypt. Uh, the breakdown in, in Libya, in Syria, is different from, uh, from what's happening uh, in, in Yemen, for example, in some ways. But that's an important um, factor that we have to keep uh, in mind. Of course, the geopolitical realignment in the region uh, is uh, forming in such a way that also buttress these uh, autocratic regimes in the region. Um, roughly, we, we see a threefold alignment in the region. Uh, one uh, is led by Turkey and Qatar, which is the revisionist camp, I would call. The revisionist camp that, is, that has backed the cause of the Arab Spring, that has supported the legitimacy of the demands of the people for peaceful change of their regimes. Um, but if you think, you know, in the last you know, couple of decades, we have seen, for example, revisionist uh, movements uh, in the Middle East. In the 60s, this was Nasser. In the 80s, this was Iran. Uh, in the early 90s, this was Iraq. In 2000, oh, with all different causes and discourses and ideologies. In 2010s, uh, this was democratization, and Turkey and Qatar was, was leading that, uh, that line. But in all these cases, status quo powers were successful to push back. Now we see that the status quo powers, which was uh, led by Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, backed by United States and Israel on the one hand, and on the other, um, Iran, uh, backed by Russia, were successful in, in keeping the order intact, uh, in keeping the autocratic regional order uh, intact. Now, this is um, uh, an important uh, development that Islamist movements have to tackle with. What we also see along with that is that there is an attempt to redefine uh, what is moderate, what is radical. Um, you know, in early 2000s, you know, after 9-11, it was Al-Qaeda versus other Islamist movements. Muslim Brotherhood was seen as, you know, uh, as, as, as a movement that renounced violence and everything. But now, there is a quite systematic attempt uh, to redefine what is uh, moderate, what is, what is radical. It turns out um, Muslim Brotherhood is also part of the radicals. Uh, there is a Ted Cruz attempt in the uh, United States to uh, declare Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization, and it's, I think, gaining momentum. And we all know what's happening in the region with the blockade and with declaration, announcement of Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. Um, um, but it turns out the Saudi line of Islam, a kind of Islam that is basically corresponding to a politics of surrender, politics of no political claims, um, a complete uh, informal empire, imperial relationship, hierarchical relationship with the United States is, is gaining traction. And this all PR campaign with the new Saudi administration is just one experience of it, um, expression of it. We also see, for example, if you look at uh, the Turkish case, uh, the AK Party in Turkey was so long seen as a model Islamist movement uh, that has found a way to bring together uh, Islamist demands and orientation uh, and democratic norms and institutions. Um, what we have seen over the last few years, like four or five years, is that that reputation is in the process of being tarnished. And Islamists, including Turkey, um, are going through a process of internal critique, and which is, you know, what Tahbe mentioned about this, this which is quite vital, um, because it's not just external factors, you know, external actors, 
suppressing Islamists and everything, that's part of the story. The other story is that internally there is a huge um, uh, problem. Uh, there are huge problem, sets of problems that Islamists have to address. Uh, for example, the, the Egyptian case showed that the vagueness about, of course, you know, we can't debate this for so long, but the questions about citizenship, equality, women, the role of Sharia, for example, the way talked about Maj'ayat al-Islamiyya, okay? this Islamic reference. What does it mean? What is the role of ulama? What is the role of al what, uh, what is the role of exact role of Sharia in political system? Uh, these kinds of questions have to be tackled uh, at intellectual level, and they also have to be put into policy in some way. Uh, we have seen, for example, in, uh, in Egypt, that part of the liberal support for the military uh, was the vagueness, the problems that, um, that was there, at least perceived problems that was there uh, on all these uh, questions. Um, now, I want to raise one last issue, which is the que question of coalition building with other uh, movements. Now, these movements are there. There's a political crackdown. There's repression. But they are not destroyed. They are on the ground. And uh, if you think of what, what happened to Muslim Brotherhood after Nasser's crackdown, you know, in 1970s, that was a very strong comeback in 1970s, 80s. Now, these movements are there. But you cannot repeat the same old line over and over again, there has to be a new uh, line of thinking, a new leadership that will be <coughs> able to build coalitions with other groups. Now, one question that is, I think, important is the question of what did this all experience, the Arab uprisings and what followed afterwards, taught uh, Islamists on the ground? Uh, part of them said, you know, we, will, we would never be, you know, the liberals or seculars, probably a better term, uh, we would never uh, tolerate a democracy that would be dominated by uh, Islamists, and they would rather support a, um, a dic military dictatorship that uh, suppresses uh, Islamists. But this is not the entire story. Uh, some, of, some of those Islamists said, we already reaffirmed what we knew, but there needs to be a leadership that will be able to build coalitions. Because what we know about authoritarian regimes is that through time, we see cracks within the authoritarian regimes. And these cracks, these openings, uh, become quite crucial for democratic transitions. So in order for that to happen, uh, there needs to be um, you know, cross-ideological, cross-movement um, uh, cross uh, coalition uh, building efforts. Uh, it might not be done right now, I don't know, because I, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an empirical question on the ground. But this is, I think, uh, the way forward for, for Islamist movements in order to gain uh, traction. So with Thank crisis you. comes opportunities, and I think this is, this is part of it. Mm -hmm.